Hello and welcome to flight test debriefs. It's a busy flight testing season, so in this video I will have a compilation of several commercial pilot flight tests from some recent flight tests I have conducted. So, um, not all these mistakes were not made by one person only. But there is also actually quite a bit of similarities between the flight tests. So, let's start with the ground portion. Typically on the commercial flight test, the ground portion is very similar to the PPL flight test. And because the marking scale is the same, I would expect most of commercial uh, flight test candidates be very proficient and have all fours or close to all fours uh, on the ground. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Uh, some of the typical ones are of in the trip preparation, for example, uh, having the GFAs uh, and knowing the validity of the GFAs, have all six of them and know that they are valid for six, six and 12 hours respectively. Uh, calculating of the true airspeed, um, one of the candidates had at the altitude at 8,500 feet, the indicated airspeed two knots higher than the true airspeed on pretty much a standard weather day. So obviously that doesn't work. And uh, it should ring an alarm bell in your head if the numbers that you're observing are very obviously incorrect. So how exactly they have to be calculated? You can look into it, but if something is obviously wrong, have a second look at your nav log. It can be headings uh, that are going in the wrong directions uh, or so. So in this case, what happened is that the candidate took the ground temperatures uh, instead of uh, temperature at the altitude and obviously that messed up the calculations. Watch for it. Uh, another one is uh, checking the conditions along the route. So for example, if we are flying into Hope and you had a few rainy days or even a few rainy weeks prior to that, you definitely want to give them a call and check the uh, surface conditions. If it was in winter and uh, there was snow and you would still tell me you would land there, I would have a problem with it because even though that might be in the scenario, uh, put yourself in the shoes of a commercial pilot, charter pilot that needs to deliver cargo. It's not only about the nav log, is Am I going to wreck the plane when I'm landing on a grass strip without any winter maintenance? So those are the critical questions that might not be on your scenario that is given to you, but this is the critical thinking that I would expect from a commercial pilot checking the surface. Um, I'm not going to give away uh, more typical questions that I may ask, uh, but you get the idea. Next one would be knowing uh, what is um, the station, knowing uh, that you are talking to, and what would be the services that you can obtain from them. So uh, there's no Campbell River Tower, so you need to know what is the radio, what is the tower, what kind of services controllers or what kind of services uh, traffic advisors can provide you. and. Uh, act accordingly so for instance if it's radio they cannot give you clearance they can pass a clearance to you uh, from another service if it's from the terminal for example but they cannot issue you a clearance so be mindful of that uh, special VFR question uh, will definitely come up um, uh, especially on the commercial uh, ground portion you need to know procedures uh, and uh, it, again, it will probably not be asked of you, okay, tell me how you do special VFR. It will be most likely in the scenario where special VFR would be appropriate procedure to use. So again, on one of the uh, ground portions, I asked the candidate, what would you do if you were approaching to Fino and the visibility decreased to one and a half miles? Uh, and the answer was that he would go back through the mountains, back to Kuala Beach area 
And when you think about it, if you have one and a half miles of visibility in the mountains, do you really want to go across the entire island? So that already sounds wrong. It has to ring an alarm bell, find a better solution. Get special VFR into Fino to land there because in that scenario, the aircraft was within 10 miles or less from the airport. Um, calculations uh, is something that uh, has to be done accurately. Uh, question for the weight and balance um, of the aircraft. Um, they used to be a rule that any time when a 2% change or so happened to an aircraft that it would need to, that the weight and balance would need to be recalculated. Uh, again, I'm not a mechanic, but to the best of my knowledge as a pilot, it needs to be done uh, pretty much every time there is a new equipment installed, so 2% or not. So. Again, you may check with the maintenance of the company where you are flying and what the procedures are. Um, another thing, if you are in a difficulty, mechanical difficulty on the ground uh, along your route, uh, it is a creative solution to ask the nearest car shop uh, to top up the tires in your aircraft. They're not qualified to do that. So make sure you do contact your maintenance, that is your first point of contact no matter what, and then take instructions from there. Don't start getting creative. You cannot typically add air in the tire. Certainly car mechanics are not allowed to do that, generally speaking. Um, calculation of the VRF. Uh, for the performance calculation of the aircraft, that's an item that is only for commercial license. Really easy calculation. Make sure you do take the correct weights. It's not your takeoff weight, it's your max gross weight. Uh, and the landing weight that has to be calculated, what's important is that it's not only the calculation of this uh, speed that you need to do, you also need to actually fly it. When we're doing a short field landing, you need to show me flying that speed calculated for our actual flight you know, for your short field landing. So it's also a practical number that has to be applied. Uh, moving on to the air portion of the flight. So if uh, you're taxiing, remember it's a good aircraft, it's a bad ground craft. Typically don't race, it's a not a race car, go at the speed at which you're walking, brisk walk, light jogging, not racing. Make sure you watch the wingtips if you're taxiing close to uh, buildings or other aircraft, really important. Um, the taking off the ETA is important to do it once you are already in the air. Uh, in many busy airports, you can sit on the ground for another 20 minutes before uh, you even get airborne. And you definitely don't want to count that time as your air time because the rest of your calculations would be incorrect. Uh, if the tower uh, tells you take off, no delay, that means no delay. You need to promptly follow the tower instructions. If you're unable, say unable and stay where you are, but do not accept the clearance. And then take your time, start the pre-takeoff briefing, start the pre-takeoff checks. It's not good. It's an operational question. It's a safety question. There can be another aircraft on short final. So if you are unable to comply with the clearance, just say unable, but do not accept the clearance and not comply with it. And if they say no delay, it's either you do that or uh, you say unable, and then you do not move for your takeoff. On the takeoff, make sure if you have op an obstacle, you will fly VX until the, the height of the obstacle is achieved. So if you have a 50 foot obstacle, you don't have to fly at VY, uh, because you might not clear the obstacle, you don't have to fly at VX all the way to 500 feet because it's not necessary you clear the obstacle at 50 feet. So you climb at VX up to 50 feet and then you transition to VY after that and then typically around 200 feet you will raise flaps. 
So uh, if you have an obstacle, it has to be Vx first. Uh, do not accelerate in uh, to Vy and then climb. Uh, when you are on your navigation portion, even though you're not, strictly speaking, following GPS, if you have GPS on the plane, open it. Use all the resources you have. Uh, even put your destination in GPS, just the direct to, you have a magenta line to guide you. Uh, one thing, I should be saying it, uh, it's a little bit cheating, but again, use all the resources you have. If you do the ground speed calculation by hand, which you will do, uh, and you have a GPS, glance at it and see what's the ground speed on the GPS. Again, it's using all available tools. If you manually calculated ground speed, which I want to see the manual calculation. And if it's a couple of knots off, that's totally fine. If your manually calculated ground speed is 30 knots off from what GPS is showing, start asking yourself questions and finding a mistake or maybe do another ground speed check. But don't just accept a wrong number and tell me that this is what it is. Don't just read the GPS number. It's uh, it's not allowed, you still have to do your calculation, but it's okay to double check your numbers with what GPS is showing. Uh, CPL and actually PPL as well, what I want to see on the navigation portion, don't use your local knowledge, use the navigation techniques. What that means, you have an ad log and you have the heading and the altitude that you should be flying. Fly those headings, fly those altitudes. Headings are important and you will be flying, say, half of your uh, navigation exercise on that heading. Once you're a little bit further uh, on your cross country, you can then compare if where you are is where you should be on your track and if it is not the case, you can say, I will make a correction double angle, opening, closing angles, or visual for PPL, CPL, everything except visual, uh, do the correction, go to your next waypoint. You cannot say, okay, well, I see my landmark, I'll just fly to it. Which brings me fast forward to the diversion exercise that I often do at the end of the flight test, but same thing applies for PPL. Candidates are allowed to use pilotage, meaning I'll follow the highway or I will follow the river, so basically following the landmarks. Commercial candidates may only use dead reckoning headings and timings, not pilotage. So it's really important that you're aware what you're allowed, what you're not allowed to do. Pencil and map only, no rulers, uh, no other ways of cheating. Um, and make sure you also do not bust any airspace, really important. A uh, couple of failures that happened uh, in the last few flight tests were exactly because the candidate entered controlled airspace, class C, uh, without clearance. If that is happening, you know that it's not a successful flight test, you cannot be doing that. Um, also, a recommendation, of, especially for commercial, uh, for private as well, um, on your navigation portion, make sure you do the uh, true airspeed check. Check with your instructor how to do it if you don't know. Uh, that confirms that your calculations on the nav log are accurate and you actually get in the performance out of the plane that you were expecting uh, uh, to achieve. Next, um, I usually do the instrument uh, uh, portion. Typically the full panel is not too bad. Uh, problems usually begin at the partial panel for commercial candidates. Rarely I have seen a failure on full panel, uh, partial panel, it's a frequent occurrence unfortunately. Couple of tips here, do not use your wristwatch 
as your timer it's very inconvenient especially if you're flying with the left hand and then you constantly have to turn it to have a look at the watch your flying will be more accurate so have a timer either on the dash or you can have it even on your um, knee board on your phone uh, that you can time your turn and as long as your calculations are correct make sure you fly exactly rate one because if it's steeper or shallower you're not going to be turning at the rate that you expect and you will be off your heading you are allowed one correction uh, so if you rolled out on the wrong heading not the one you expected do the calculation again and make one correction you're allowed to do that and still pass the exercise the most frequent error here is to turn in the wrong direction so breeze take a moment figure out how many seconds and in which direction you need to turn i had several times the candidates would be say within even 20 degrees of their desired heading then they do a correction by 20 degrees in the wrong direction and they end up 40 degrees off considering the flight test tolerances the original heading might even have given him them something like a two after the correction it becomes a one so don't make it worse on yourself take a moment to think it is okay to take a moment to think and to recalculate do not make a correction in the wrong direction uh, navigation exercise on instruments uh, I recommend always uh, to draw on the map. Now, uh, backtrack, uh, new rules. If the plane is equipped with GPS, you will have to use GPS. If you have VOR or ADF only, that this is uh, what will be used. So, uh, if you are using the VOR and that's where it says to draw the lines that's the because for gps you already have uh, better references right away check if the answer you are given to me actually makes sense so in one of the examples the so try to recall your local knowledge or pull up the map of uh, Vancouver VTA so uh, I asked uh, to the reference of Pete Meadows VOR on which radial we currently were and the plane was somewhere uh, on top of Mission at 2500 feet so after some fiddling with the VOR the candidate tells me that we are on the 150 radial from and then changes this to 3502 both answers are completely off had that candidate actually drew the line of those uh, radials that he was giving me uh, from the VOR from the Pit Meadows VOR and knowing that we were over Mission City at that time was like 90 degrees off um, they would be like okay wait a second I should be somewhere to the east of Pit Meadows that's what VOR should indicate to me and then search for the correct answer so if you can't visualize it in your head or you think you might do it incorrectly in a stressful situation you're allowed to take a pencil and draw that radial on your map visualize it it will be very helpful and remember that it's not just navigation nobody canceled your six-pack flying so if while you're doing your navigation or figuring out the radial or identifying the station instead of flying straight and level that was assigned to you you start going multiple degrees left and right or up and down that may trigger a fail on that exercise because you still have to keep the aircraft under control while you're doing your navigation so it's not either or uh, you need to do both uh, when you are identifying a station uh, make sure if you have two VORs that you are using one you can double check with the other one uh, but on one of the flight tests uh, the candidate actually identified um, the station on one uh, radio on one uh, 
nav com but flew it on the other one uh, you might have identified that the ground station is working you don't know if your second um, a receiver is actually properly working so use the one on which you perform the identification my pet peeve on um, a lot of um, upper air work is the eyes outside we're flying around Vancouver area which is extremely extremely busy and sometimes you have like five planes going for the same field simulated forced approach so how do we deal with it by looking outside frankly if your steep turn is a little bit less perfect but you looked outside you'll get better marks from me than if you're doing the entire thing an instrument because that's a big fat one because we only have on commercial flight test for instrument exercises and this is when I'm looking outside for you it's full panel partial panel unusual attitudes and instrument nap anything beyond that if you're looking on your instrument instead of looking outside it's a one there are no questions it doesn't matter how perfect the steep turn a slow flight is if it's on instruments it's a one because it is unsafe so make sure you do look outside uh, on this uh, uh, stall something that is um, somewhat typical is to have the not full not aircraft fully stalled on the commercial flight test i may ask for a little bit more advanced stall like for example stall with full power or turning and you still need to make sure the plane is fully stalled if we're doing it in a cessna at two and a half three four thousand feet nothing will happen to you the plane will stall and you will do the recovery but the full stall has to be achieved uh, it's not optional As you're flying, uh, make sure you're also listening to the tra uh, practice area frequency. Actually, it goes back to looking out. Uh, we say see and be seen, but also talk and be heard. It doesn't mean you have to be talking all the time. You need to do your position reports, but what's more important, you listen to other people's position reports. Don't keep talking all the time. I'd rather you talk less, even through some procedures that you are doing, but listen to where the other planes are. If somebody is reporting same altitude, same area where you are, it is okay to interrupt your exercise, figure out the traffic, and you will be given the chance to redo the exercise if there is some imminent safety concern and it can be coming from the outside. So make sure you do listen to the traffic. I obviously will help you to look out and listen to the traffic myself as well because it's also my safety so this is the area where it's teamwork however you need to show me that you are actually doing that as well and not relying on me to do it for you usually towards the end of the flight test we will do a simulated precautionary landing and I will give you some scenario. So if we are landing on a friend's backyard for a barbecue, you can do a full procedure, high pass, low pass, everything is usual. If the procedure requires urgency, you may want to modify it. So if we are saying we're fuel critical, you might not even have enough fuel for high pass, low pass. And, or you don't want to recline, maybe you do high pass one way and descending for low pass, and. Uh, turning around and landing again uh, for both precautionary and the diversion think about this scenario and adapt uh, and show me if urgency is required that you apply that urgency again diversion for commercial candidates it's dead reckoning only uh, something else is the fuel calculation i've seen often enough okay we took off with four hours of fuel we flew for one hour so we have three hours of fuel doesn't mean you have three hours of fuel there is a number of fuel problems that can develop in flight for example 
you lost a fuel cap and the fuel will siphoned out from the fuel tank so you don't have it anymore or maybe the fuel line is blocked from one side and instead of having four hours of fuel now you have only two hours of fuel because the fuel the engine can take fuel only from one tank so before you assume you have the fuel that you took off from minus the fuel used use all the resources maybe your engine was using more fuel than expected so check your fuel gauges do your calculations from the takeoff by all means but use all the available resources don't rely on the fuel calculations from takeoff only uh, at the end as you are coming in for landing uh, make sure you're following the airport procedures and following them correctly. Some airports can be confusing. Uh, Big Meadows, for example, has two uh, parallel uh, runways and one more intersecting ones. So um, in one of the scenarios that are clear, the candidate to go for landing on uh, 08 right and the candidate with uh, for runway 18. If you happen to do the flight test in an unfamiliar airport for whatever reason, make sure you familiarize yourself with the circuit. If it's to the left, or if it's left-hand circuit or right-hand circuit, uh, any noise abatement procedures, you have to follow all of them. I shouldn't be helping you on any of the flight tests with the airport procedures. Uh, the last closing comment is the uh, landings not only on the flight test, but any landing, always assume, always expect that it is a crosswind landing. You may have a little bit of crosswind or a lot of crosswind, but chances are you have at least some. So train yourself, even if it's a specialty landing, short field, soft field, always accept, expect crosswind. If you happen not to have a crosswind, that's a bonus, but every time prepare yourself for crosswind. I've seen. Uh, way too many landings on uh, private and commercial flight tests with quite a significant crosswind, but the candidate was so busy doing soft field or short field procedure that they forget that there is crosswind as well. So account for it and it will allow you to keep the plane nicely on the center line, which the examiner very much likes to see. I know it might have been a lot. I hope these tips were helpful. Many of them would apply to private and commercial, but I tried to summarize here some of the commercial specific comments. But feel free to comment below, ask questions. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel for the next updates. Thank you very much for listening.